Seven Wonders is a game for three to seven players. There are rules for a two-player variant, included for those who don't have any friends. I won't be going over the rules for the two-player variant in this video. There's also a separate two-player version called Seven Wonders Duel. If you haven't already bought this game and you want a two-player game, I'd recommend getting that one instead. The idea of Seven Wonders is that each player controls an ancient civilization and builds it from the ground up. There are seven different civilizations, and each one is centered around one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. One thing I love about this game is that everyone takes their turns simultaneously, so the game goes pretty quick, and the dynamics don't change that much if you add more people. This game uses card drafting as its core mechanic. Each player will look at the cards in their hand, choose one, and pass the rest of the hand to the next player. Then they'll look at the hand that was just passed to them, choose one, and pass it on again. You repeat this until there's only two cards left, and then you choose one and discard the other. This will be done for all three ages, so once you get that down, the game is pretty easy to play. Inside the box, you'll find three decks of cards, one for each age, seven civilization boards and cards, cardboard coins in denominations of one and three, military victory and defeat tokens, a scoring pad, a quick reference sheet, a full rulebook, and a couple of cards for the two-player variant of the game. Before we get to the setup, I'm going to talk about the civilization boards and the wonder spaces. The civilization boards each have a different name and unique artwork. In the top left-hand corner, you'll see a symbol. These symbols represent the various resources in the game, and the one on your board is the resource you have access to. Each civilization has a different starting resource. The boards also have two to four sections for the construction of a wonder. Despite the word wonder being in the name of the game, you don't actually have to build your wonder to win. You can even skip it entirely if you want to. I'll get into building wonders in more detail later, but for now, just remember that the costs for building your wonder, the number of slots you have, the benefits given by building your wonder, and the starting resource are what make the difference between playing as one civilization and another. The setup for this game can vary, depending on how many players you have, and in some cases, how much experience each player has playing the game. The first thing to do is to get our cards in order. There are three different decks, each representing an age. Keep these decks separate. First, we need to go through these decks to set them up for the game. At the bottom of each card is a number ranging from 3 to 7. This number corresponds to the number of players you have. If you have three players, you would only use the cards with the three plus symbol at the bottom. If you had four players, you would add all the cards with the four plus symbol. For five players, add both the four plus and five plus cards, and so on. In this video, I'll be setting up the game as though there were four players. Any cards you're not using can be put back into the box. Repeat this setup for all three decks. The third age deck also has 10 purple cards with no number at the bottom. These are the guild cards and they will be randomized for every game. Shuffle these separately and then count out enough cards for the number of players plus two. So since I have four players, I'm going to count out four plus two. The rest of the guild cards can go back into the box with the others. Now place the second and third age decks somewhere that they won't be in the way. Next, place all of your coins and military tokens in the middle of the table so everyone can reach them. Give each player three coins to start with. Now it's time to assign everyone their civilization. There are a few ways to do this. I usually just shuffle the civilization cards and deal one to each player. Whichever civilization they got is the one they're playing with. If you're playing multiple games in a row, you might want to let everyone choose which one they play as. That way, people don't get stuck with the same one twice. You might have noticed the A and B on both the civilization boards and the cards. The A side and B side of each board is a little bit different in the way the wonder is constructed or in the benefits it gives. If you want to let everyone choose which side they play with, you can do that. Or you can make them spin the card that corresponds with the board they're using and whichever letter is facing up when they stop is the side they have to use, or any other method you can think up. 
Okay, heads is A, tails is B. Generally speaking, the A side is a little simpler, so you can just start with that side if you like. Once each player has their board and has decided which side they're using, we can deal the cards for the first age. Deal the first age deck into piles of seven cards. There should be the same number of piles as there are players. If you have more or less than the number of players, or if any of the piles doesn't have seven cards, you probably mess something up with the number on the bottom of the cards. Go ahead and fix that now because you can't play the game properly otherwise. With that done, hand each player one of the piles of cards and you're ready to get started. Here's a good example of how the cards look. You'll have the main effect here, the name of the card here, the card's cost, sometimes there will be a banner here, if you had built the theater this card would be free, and sometimes you'll also have another banner. And that means that if you build this card, in the next age, the gardens will be free. This game has a lot of symbols in it, which act sort of like a written language. I'll cover what they mean now so that you have a decent idea of what I'm talking about as they come up later. The cards are all color-coded, so you can easily tell what type of card each one is. The blue cards just give you victory points. The green cards are science cards. The red cards are military cards. The yellow cards are commerce cards. The gray cards are manufactured materials. And the brown cards are raw materials. Whenever you see this wreath symbol, that means you gain the amount of points inside of it. So this card would give you two points, or this card would give you three. These gray cards are manufactured materials. So these are resource cards. This one would give you a glass, and this one would give you a cloth. The brown cards are raw materials. These two would give you a brick and a stone. This one, because it has a slash, means that you could either take a wood or an ore each turn. Similar to that one, we have this one, but because there's no slash, that means you can take two stone for this card. There's a lot more symbols on the yellow cards than on any other kind of card, so I'll walk you through as many of those as I can. This means coins, so this card would give you 5 coins when you played it. This one also has the coin symbol, but it doesn't give you coins for playing it. Instead, it reduces the cost of buying glass, cloth, or papyrus from your two neighbors by one coin. This one is similar to the last one but it reduces the cost of any of the raw materials, but only if you buy it from the player to your left. And this one is the same, but for the player to your right. You can play both of these cards and have a discount for each one. You'll see these same arrows here, but what this card does is it gives you a coin for each brown card that's been played by your left and right neighbors and yourself. And this is the same, but it gives you two coins for each gray card for your left and right neighbors and yourself. This pyramid symbol is the Wonder Construction symbol. This card would give you three coins for each stage of the wonder that you've built. And you'll also get an extra point for each stage that you've built by the end of the game. This card would give you a coin for every yellow card you've played and you'll get a point for every yellow card you've played by the end of the game. This card is the same, but it gives you two coins for every gray card, and two points for every gray card you've played. You remember this resource card with the slash in it? There are two similar cards as well, but they have more than two options. Once again, you can only choose one of these options per turn. If you have both, you can choose one from each. These are the three science symbols, the gear, the tablet, and the square and compass.
This is the military strength symbol. For each symbol that you have in play, you have one military strength. These come in amounts of one, two, and three, depending on which age you play them in. See these rotation symbols on the back of the cards? These are a reminder of which direction to pass your cards when you finish choosing one. In age one, you pass to the left. In age two, you pass to the right. And in age three, it's back to the left again. The object of the game is to have the most points at the end. You can gain points by playing cards, constructing stages of your wonder, or by having the strongest military. The game would be pretty simple if you just collected as many point cards as you could, but that's where the strategy comes in. Some cards have a cost, and if you can't pay the cost, you can't take that card. In age one, most of the cards are pretty cheap or even free, and they'll be pretty easy to get. But as the game goes on, things start to get more expensive. In order to pay for a card, all you need to do is have the same number and type of resource played as is listed on the card. You don't lose the resources you're paying with. You just can only use each one once per turn. For example, let's say you've played the ore vein and the quarry. Now you want to play the aqueduct. You can see that it costs three stone. The quarry gives you two stone, but the ore vein doesn't give you any, so you can't afford this card. You could, however, play the arena card, as it costs two stone and one ore. You'll notice your wonder slots also have costs next to them. When you want to build a stage of your wonder, you'll choose a card in your hand and play it face down underneath the wonder slot you're building. You can ignore the cost printed on the card, but you must be able to pay the cost on that wonder slot. You must build these in order from left to right. You don't have to play them in any particular age. In other words, you could build all of them in age one if you can pay for it. If you're unable to play a card because you can't afford it, or you simply don't like any of the other options, you can always discard a card and take three coins. As you add cards to accommodate more players, some new cards will become available, but there will also be some duplicates of cards that were already in the deck. If you want to play a card, but you've already played one with the same name and artwork, you can't play this card face up. You could discard it for coins or use it to build your wonder if you'd like. I'm going to mention your neighbors several times throughout this video. I'm only talking about the two players seated directly to your left and right. You won't be able to interact with anyone else during the game. This includes trading coins for resources and comparing militaries at the end of each age. If your neighbor has a resource you need, you can pay them two coins to use it. It doesn't matter if they're already using that resource, you can still use it too. And they're not allowed to stop you. Okay, let's go a little more in depth about how the game is played. Starting in age one, each player will choose one card and place it face down in front of them and then pass their hand to the player on their left. Once every player has chosen a card, you will all play your cards, either playing it face up discarding it for three coins, or building a wonder stage. Once that step is done, you'll take the next hand that was passed to you and repeat this process. Continue doing this until you have a hand of two cards. At this point, you'll choose one and place it face down as usual, and then you'll discard the other card. Play your final hand, and then that's the end of the first age. At the end of each age, everyone will compare their military strength with the strength of their two neighbors. Player one compares their military strength with their two neighbors. They win combat for age one against both of them. They don't compare with player four since they aren't neighbors with them. Since they won combat twice, they get two military victory tokens, and they give both neighbors a defeat token. At the end of age one, you get a one point token. At the end of age two, you get a three point token. And at the end of age three, you get a five point token. If you have a weaker military, you get a military defeat token. In all three ages, this is a negative one point token. After militaries are compared, deal out the cards for the next age, and repeat the drafting process again. After you've completed all three ages, it's time to total up the scores. Using the scoring sheet provided, have each player tell you their scores, 
in each individual scoring area. Since everything is color coded, this is pretty easy to total up. Go in the order on the sheet. The first row is for the player names. The second row is for military scores. Add up all the military victory and defeat tokens you have to determine your score for military. The third is for points scored with coins. You get one point for every three coins you have. Leftover coins don't give you any points. Next are the points from Wonder Construction. If any stage of your wonder has the victory point symbol, you score the number listed there. Then is the victory point cards, which are pretty self-explanatory. Then economy cards. Most of these don't give you points, but a few of them do. Next are the guild cards. These are the most varied in terms of how you score points, so we'll go over these in more detail later. And finally, science cards. Science cards are last because they're the most complicated to score. For each type of science card you've played, you gain points equal to the number of cards squared. So for instance, if you've played four tablet cards, you get 16 points. You also gain seven points for each set of all three types. So if you've played four tablet cards, two gear cards, and one square and compass card, your total for science would be 16 plus 4 plus 1 plus 7, or 28 points. Here we played four tablets and the guild card that lets you choose any science symbol. We chose the tablet, bringing us up to five tablets, so our score is 25. Whoever has the highest score is the winner. And that's Seven Wonders. You could get started playing now, and if you come across questions, just look in the rulebook to clarify them. One more thing you will need to know is that each wonder grants special abilities when you build certain stages of them. All of these are different, so I'm not going to go into detail here, but I will in the next section of the video. You can find the rules for these in the rulebook or on the quick reference sheet. I'm going to cover some of the finer details and the frequently asked questions at this point, so keep watching if you'd like to learn a little more. First, I'm going to explain the special abilities granted by building your wonder. The first one is roads. On the A side, when you build the second stage of your wonder, you get to add two military strength to your total for the rest of the game. On the B side, there's only two stages of the wonder, and each one gives you one military strength. But you also get coins and points when you build those stages, so that's an added bonus. For Babylon's A side, you get the Any Science Symbol bonus when you build the second stage of your wonder. You don't have to decide which symbol you'd like to use until the very end of the game. On the B side, you get that ability at the third wonder stage, and at the second, you get a different ability. This ability allows you to play both cards at the end of each age instead of discarding one. You will have to pay for both of them, but you could discard one for coins if you wish. For the A side of Olympia, once you build the second stage of your wonder, you get the ability to play one card in each age without paying the cost of it. If you build this in the second age, you don't get to play two cards to make up for missing one in the last age. And the same goes for the third age, so build this in age one if you can. The B-side has two new abilities. The first stage acts like a trading postcard, except it works for both of your neighbors. The third stage allows you to copy one of your neighbor's guild cards at the end of the game. You won't simply copy the score they get from it, though. You have to score it as though you had played the card yourself. Giza has no special abilities, only points. The A-side gives you 15 points for playing all three stages, and the B-side gives you 20 points but has four stages to build. At stage 2, Alexandria's A-side gives you the ability to use one of any raw material resource each turn, the same as having the Caravansary card. On the B-side, you get this bonus at stage 1, and at stage 2, you get one of any manufactured material resource, which is the same as the Forum card. Halicarnassus' Halicarnassus's A-side has a very powerful ability. At the time that you build this stage of the wonder, you may go through the discard pile and choose any card to play for free. On the B-side, 
you get to do that three times. Also, it's important to know that you do this at the end of the turn, so any cards discarded that turn are available. If you play this at the last turn of the age, you get to look through all the cards that were discarded from that age. Finally, we come to Ephesus. On the A side, the second stage of this wonder gives you 9 coins. On the B side, you get 4, 4, and another 4, as well as the points that go with them. Next, we're going to cover the guild cards. The Scientist Guild gives you the ability to take one of any science symbol that you'd like. The Strategist Guild gives you one point for every military defeat token that both of your neighbors have. So if the person to your left has three military defeat tokens and the player to your right has two, you'll get five points. The Spies Guild gives you one point for every military card that both of your neighbors have played. The Workers Guild gives you one point for every raw materials resource card that both of your neighbors have played. The Magistrates Guild gives you one victory point for every blue card that both of your neighbors have played. The Builders Guild gives you one victory point for every wonder stage that both of your neighbors and yourself have completed. So, if both of your neighbors and you have all completed three stages of the wonder, you'll get nine points for this card. The Shop Owners Guild gives you one point for every raw material card, manufactured material card, and guild card that you've played, including this one. The Traders Guild gives you one victory point for every economy card that both of your neighbors have played. The Philosopher's Guild gives you one victory point for every science card that both of your neighbors have played. And the Craftsman's Guild gives you two victory points for every manufactured material card that both of your neighbors have played. The last thing I want to mention is the timing of certain effects for playing cards with multiple benefits. For instance, when you play the Lighthouse, there are two different effects. You get one coin for each yellow card you have in play, and you get one victory point for each yellow card you have in play. These can be two different numbers, because whenever you play a card or build a wonder stage that gives you coins, you take those coins immediately. So if you played it for the first round of H3, you might get three coins for having three yellow cards. Yes, you do include this card in the total. But by the end of H3, maybe you'll have played two more yellow cards. In this case, you'll end up getting five points during scoring for this card. Okay, I think that covers everything. I hope this video was helpful for you. As always, if there's a game you'd like me to make a tutorial on, leave a comment down below. Thanks for tuning in.